Welcome to History of Health Information Technology in the U.S. History of Privacy and Security Legislation. This is Lecture C, High-Tech Privacy and Security Regulations. This lecture will describe the changes that occurred in the HIPAA legislation as a result of the High-Tech Act. The objectives for this lecture, High-Tech Privacy and Security Regulations, are to describe the major changes in privacy and security requirements as a result of high-tech and the reasons why the changes were needed. HIPAA introduced the concept of Protected Health Information, or PHI. This is health information that also includes identifiers that would allow someone to identify the person to whom the information belongs, such as the person's name, social security number, photograph, etc. When the HIPAA privacy rule first became mandatory, there was confusion on how strict it really was intended to be and its requirements to keep PHI confidential. Consultants and lawyers often painted a worst-case scenario frightening healthcare facilities about the possibilities of lawsuits if they did not make very strict policies. In fact, early on, there was talk about the need to soundproof all patient rooms so that conversations with patients would have no chance of being overheard. Over the years, most places realized that the regulations were intended to guide realistic, not extreme, methods of protecting the information. However, there also were difficulties with enforcing the regulations. Originally, enforcement was divided between the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, and the Office for Civil Rights, or OCR. OCR handled privacy complaints, while CMS was responsible for the enforcement of the security regulations. This created inefficiencies. Even before HITECH was passed, OCR became responsible for both privacy and security enforcement, which improved the enforcement process. Today, OCR is responsible for both privacy and security enforcement. In addition to the challenges of enforcement, other modifications over the years made many privacy advocates feel that the law was not strong enough. For instance, patients had to be provided with a notice of privacy practices that the health care facility followed. Patients had to indicate that they received the notice but did not have to provide explicit consent to the practices. Privacy notices usually stated that the information could be shared for what is referred to as TPO. That is, information could be shared with doctors for treatment, that's the T, payment, the P, to insurance companies, and for hospital operations, such as quality improvement activities. Patients did not have to be notified when such sharing for TPO occurred. Finally, over the years since 2003, there have been a number of breaches, that is, where the information security was compromised or the information was not kept secure. There was one case where medical records from a large university medical center somehow had been put on the web and remained there for several months before it was discovered. There was no evidence that anyone had done anything with the information, but still, it was a major breach. There have been reports of medical records found on discarded computers or computers that were sold by hospitals as surplus. There have also been reports of medical records being kept on portable devices, such as external hard drives or laptops, that have been lost or stolen. The picture shows a notebook computer with a variety of portable storage devices. You can see that with the small size and easy portability of modern devices, it would be very easy to have problems. As we discussed in the previous lecture, there are recommended best practices for security that include having clear policies, attending to physical security of the devices on which the information is stored, 
and encrypting all PHI. Unfortunately, in many of the cases of breaches, those practices were not followed. As we said about the rationale behind the HIPAA rules and the philosophy embodied in the recommendations in For the Record, strong but doable privacy and security recommendations are going to be needed to realize the vision embodied in the High Tech Act. That is, a key part of High Tech is to promote the electronic exchange of health information and for the public and health professionals to be supportive of that exchange there must be a good framework for privacy and security. The high-tech requirements embody the same rationale as the original HIPAA legislation, but the specifics will require significant changes in many current practices. These specifics are determined by the government after review by key stakeholders. Initially, there is a notice of proposed rulemaking, where interested parties can comment on the plans for the actual rule before it is finalized. Often, as is the case with the HIPAA changes as a result of high tech, there is an interim rule in effect, while the rules are being finalized. One of the changes in the High Tech Act relates to who is required to comply with the HIPAA rules. The term covered entities refers to organizations that are required to comply with the HIPAA rules. The original HIPAA rules considered covered entities to be health plans, for instance, the insurance companies who pay the claims for a patient's medical bills, health care providers, such as doctors, hospitals, pharmacies, etc., and health care clearinghouses, which often work with health plans or providers to facilitate billing or provide other services. There are other people who work with covered entities who are called business associates. Business associates could be, for instance, an outside IT vendor who works with the hospital on its EHR. Under the original HIPAA rules, business associates were not directly covered, although hospitals had to draw up agreements with their business associates to assure that the rules would be followed. As described in the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking related to the high-tech changes, in the area of business associates, the Act makes a number of changes. First, Section 13401 of the Act applies certain provisions of the security rule that apply to covered entities directly to their business associates and makes business associates liable for civil and criminal penalties for the failure to comply with these provisions. Similarly, Section 13404 makes business associates of covered entities civilly and criminally liable under the privacy rule for making uses and disclosures of protected health information that do not comply with the terms of their business associate contracts. The Act also provides that the additional privacy and security requirements of Subtitle D of the Act are applicable to business associates and that such requirements shall be incorporated into business associate contracts. When the final rule came out in January of 2013, it said that HIPAA will apply directly not only to a covered entity's business associates, but to the business associates subcontractors and the subcontractors subcontractors, and so on, all the way down the line. The high-tech legislation also includes specific language that includes other entities as business associates. These include health information exchanges, that is HIEs, and regional health information organizations, or RIOs, personal health record vendors, e-prescribing gateways, and quality monitoring organizations. They therefore now are responsible for compliance. The legislation also clearly states that all entities entering into a health agreement must have a business associates agreement. 
This would apply to physician practices as well as other healthcare entities. The original HIPAA regulations stated the covered entity must always use the minimum necessary amount of PHI to conduct a function or work task. Under the High Tech Act, this discretion will be limited by future rulemaking. Although the January 2013 rule did not clarify it any further, it is expected that future guidance will provide more clarification. HITECH places new restrictions and requirements on covered entities for accounting of disclosures. The accounting of disclosures would be a listing of any information that was released, to whom and when it was released. In the original regulations, covered entities had to provide an accounting of disclosures of patient information on demand. That is, they did not routinely do it, but if the patient requested it, they would give the information to whom the information had been disclosed. However, previously those disclosures made for the purposes of TPO or treatment or payment and health care operations did not have to be tracked or provided to the patient. Many privacy advocates felt that not reporting those TPO disclosures violated the principle of consumer control. Now, new rules are being proposed for accounting of disclosures, or AOD. Under these proposed regulations, if there are disclosures through an electronic health record, the covered entity must track all disclosures, including the ones for TPO. The specific requirements related to AOD are not in the final rule, but a later guidance will provide clarification. In addition, in the original HIPAA regulations, covered entities had the choice to honor patient requests for certain restrictions. Under the new rules, as clarified by the HIPAA Omnibus Rule, all covered entities must honor the individual's request to restrict a disclosure to a health plan if the patient or the patient's representative is paying out-of-pocket for treatment. Out-of-pocket means that the insurance company is not paying for the visit and the patient pays for the services themselves with cash, check, or credit card. The patient must make the request at time of presentation for treatment. If a healthcare organization is using an electronic medical record, HITECH grants patients the right to request an electronic copy of their own information. This component of the legislation also states that if the entity has that capability, the entity must transfer the information directly to other entities if requested to do so by the patient. The final rule presents details of how patients can receive an electronic copy of their record and how they may designate a third party to receive a copy. Accounting for some disclosures can be quite complex. Organizations with multiple electronic record systems will have an extremely difficult time complying with the requirement to track all disclosures related to TPO. These types of organizations typically have electronic medical records that are fed by complex independent systems, such as lab, radiology, etc., making the tracking difficult. Restricting disclosure to insurance companies can also be difficult. Consider an office practice that uses e-prescribing programs. With these programs, a physician enters the prescription into the system and typically the prescription is sent electronically to the patient's pharmacy. What if the patient requests to pay in cash when they present at the doctor's office and the physician writes an electronic prescription during the course of treatment? Now, two healthcare entities are involved. The pharmacy may proceed to fill the prescription and, in most cases, would probably use their computer to apply the cost to the patient's insurance carrier, especially because they were not directly informed not to disclose. It is the patient's responsibility to request a restriction to each covered entity for services for which they pay in full out of pocket. This is only one example 
of the complexity of these restrictions, and the final rule includes some very specific things that can and cannot be done in regard to this aspect of disclosure. Compliance with this new requirement will likely result in the complete reevaluation of how work is done not only within, but between, healthcare providers. Providing patients with electronic copies of their records requires that the healthcare organization comply with the appropriate safeguards for transferring this information. One way to do this is through a patient portal, where the patient can view and or download the information to their computer or media of their choice. If the patient requests an unencrypted copy of their records, say by email or on a flash drive, the organization can provide it, but before doing so, the organization needs to educate the patient regarding the risks of unencrypted PHI. Another challenging area in the new rule involves requirements for reporting breaches of information security. In the final rule, if there is unauthorized access to protected health information, it is assumed to be a breach unless a risk assessment shows that there is low probability that the protected health information has been compromised or one of the other exceptions to the definition of breach applies. An example of a low probability that the data were compromised might be if patient information were sent to a wrong patient by mistake, but the address was wrong, so the mail was returned by the post office unopened. The new breach laws apply to both paper and electronic systems. Although the focus is on notification and reporting, there is also what is called a safe harbor for some information. That is, breaches of certain information do not need to be reported. Breaches of secured information, that is, information that is unreadable, unusable, or indecipherable to unauthorized individuals by either encryption or destruction, are not reportable. Also, certain inadvertent breaches by authorized individuals are not reportable. The major challenges are in the notification requirements for unsecured information. The notification requirements are quite strict. Not only must individuals be notified promptly, but if more than 500 individuals are affected, the institution must notify the media serving that state or jurisdiction, and you can just imagine how a health care provider will feel to see their information security problems on the front page of the local paper. In addition, they must maintain a log of breaches and report them annually to the government, specifically the Department of Health and Human Services, or DHHS, as it is abbreviated. However, if a breach involves 500 or more individuals, they must notify DHHS at the same time they are notifying the individuals and the media. These breaches will be posted automatically on the DHHS website. Finally, there is also an increase in potential penalties. The interim final rule was effective September 23, 2009, and it was expected that a final rule would be announced after a short comment period. In fact, DHHS had a final rule all prepared, but in 2010 they decided it needed more work. As with the original HIPAA regulation, there were a huge number of comments and they were often conflicting. One major area where there was conflict was on how to deal with the idea of harm from the breaches. The interim rule stated that breaches needed to be reported if there was significant risk of financial, reputational, or other harm. Healthcare facilities were expected to assess the degree of harm from any breaches, but there was disagreement as to whether they were the best people to make that decision. Also, it is difficult to determine how much harm is significant. There were many different views on those questions. Healthcare organizations already felt that the new rules were a burden. 
The Department of Health and Human Services felt it might be a burden to patients to notify them every time a minor breach occurred, especially one that clearly did not cause harm, while privacy advocates felt that the notification was very important. And Congress, which passed the High Tech Act, felt that their intent was to strengthen the existing laws and did not want changes to what they had passed without their involvement. When the final rule came out at the beginning of 2013, there was a major change to the standard for breach notification. Rather than focusing on the risk of harm to the patient, the focus is now on whether the data were compromised. The final omnibus rule again calls for a risk assessment, as was included in the interim final breach notification rule. But now the risk assessment is to determine the likelihood that compromise had occurred and the rule specifies what type of information must be included in the risk assessment. The information includes the type and amount of PHI, including the identifiers and the risk of re-identification, who had access and the likelihood that they actually viewed the PHI, and finally, what was done to mitigate the risk once the problem was discovered. Like the original HIPAA regulations, it is likely there will be other clarifications and modifications over the years as we get more experience with the benefits and burdens of these new rules. This concludes History of Privacy and Security Legislation. In summary, when the HIPAA regulations first became mandatory, there was confusion about the requirements. There were security breaches, and there were some difficulties with enforcement of the rules. To make health information exchange safe, the High Tech Act expanded and clarified the privacy and security rules of HIPAA.